Chapter Twenty of the Mystery of the Four Fingers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mystery of the Four Fingers by Fred M. White. Chapter Twenty The Prodigal's Return. Money can do most things, even in the matter of furnishing a large house with competent servants, and by six o'clock Vera had contrived for the domestic machine to run a little more smoothly. At any rate, she was in a position now to provide Fenwick with something in the shape of a respectable dinner on his return from town. It was about a quarter to eight when he put in an appearance, and for the first time for some days he changed into evening dress for the chief meal of the day. He appeared to be as morose and savage as he had been in the morning, in fact even more so, if that were possible. He answered Vera's questions curtly, so that she fell back upon herself and ate her soup in silence. And yet, though Fenwick was so quiet, it seemed to Vera that he was regarding her with a deep distrust, so that she found herself flushing under his gaze. He put his spoon down presently, and pointed with his hand to Vera's swollen fingers. "'What have you got there?' he demanded. "'How did you do that?' "'I burnt it,' Vera stammered. "'It was an accident.' "'Well, I don't suppose you burnt it on purpose,' Fenwick growled. "'I don't suppose you put your hand into the fire to see if it was hot.' what i asked you was how you did it please answer my question i repeat it was an accident vera said coldly i burnt my fingers in such a way yes and you are not the first woman who has burnt her fingers interfering with things that don't concern her i insist upon knowing exactly how that accident happened vera turned a cold contemptuous face to her companion she began to understand now that his suspicions were aroused it came back to her vividly enough that she had dropped the hot sovereign on the floor, and that, owing to the shock and sudden surprise, she had not replaced it. It was just possible that Fenwick had gone into the little room and had missed the sovereign from the neat layer of coins on the top of the box. And then another dreadful thought came to Vera, supposing that the drugged man had not recovered from the effects of his dose by the time Fenwick had returned. It was a point which both she and Venner had overlooked. There was nothing for it but to take refuge behind an assumed indignation, and decline to answer offensive questions put in that tone of voice. Vera was still debating as to the most contemptuous reply, when the dining-room door opened, and one of the newly arrived servants announced Mr. Blossett. Fenwick rose to his feet, and an unmistakable oath escaped his lips. All the same, he forced a kind of sickly smile to his face as a big man, with an exceedingly red face and an exceedingly offensive swaggering manner, came into the dining-room. The stranger was quite well dressed, nothing about his garments offended the eye or outraged good taste, yet, all the same, the man had bounder written all over him in large letters. His impudent red face, his aggressively waxed moustache, and the easy familiarity of his manner caused Vera to shrink within herself, though she could have been grateful to the fellow for the diversion which his appearance had created. "'Well, Fenwick, my buck,' he cried, "'you didn't expect that I should accept your invitation quite so promptly, but I happen to be knocking around here, and I thought I'd drop in and join you and your chop. This is your daughter, I suppose? Glad to make your acquaintance, miss. I was told there were many beauties at Merton Grange, but I find that there is one more than I expected.' Vera merely bowed in reply. The man was so frankly, hopelessly, utterly vulgar that her uppermost feeling was one of amusement. She could see that Fenwick was terribly annoyed, though for some reason he had to keep himself in hand and be agreeable to Blossett. "'Sit down,' he said. "'Ring the bell, and we will get another cover laid. I don't suppose you mind missing the soup?' "'I have been in the soup too often to care about it,' Blossett laughed. "'To tell the truth, we had such a warm time last night that solid food and myself are not on speaking terms just now. Here, waiter, fill me a tumbler of champagne.' I dare say, when I have got that down my neck, I shall be able to pay my proper attentions to this young lady. Fenwick made no reply. He cut savagely at his fish, as if he were passing the knife over the throat of the intruder. Meanwhile the stranger rattled on, doubtless under the impression that he was making himself exceedingly agreeable. Vera sat there watching the scene, with a certain sense of amusement. She was still a little pale and unsteady, still doubtful as to the amount of information that Fenwick had gleaned as to her movements that afternoon. She would be glad to get away presently, and try to ascertain for herself whether the drugged man had recovered or not. Meanwhile, there was no occasion for her to talk, as the intruder was quite able to carry on all the necessary conversation. "'This is a mighty fine tipple,' he
he said. Waiter, get me another tumbler of champagne. In my checkered career, I don't often run up against this class of lotion. The worst of it is, it makes one talk too fast, and seeing that I have got to run the gauntlet with the next little parcel of sparklers. Fool! Fenwick burst out. His face was livid with rage. His eyes were shot with passionate anger. Fool! Can't you be silent? Don't you see that there is one here who is outside? Beg pardon, Blossett said unsteadily. I thought the young woman knew all about it. Lord, with her dainty face and her aristocratic air, what a bonnet she'd make. Wouldn't she look nice passing off as the daughter of the old military swell, with a fondness for a little game of cards? You know what I mean. The same game that old Jim and his wife used to play. Be silent, Fenwick thundered, in a tone that at last seemed to penetrate the thick skull of his companion. My, my daughter knows nothing of these things. Blossett stammered something incoherent. His manner became more sullen, and long before dinner was completed, it was evident that he had had far more wine than was good for him. "'If you will excuse me, I will leave you,' Vera said coldly. "'I do not care for any dessert or coffee to-night.' "'Perhaps you had better go,' Fenwick said with an air of relief. "'I will take care that this thing does not happen again.' But Vera had already left the room. She was still consumed with anxiety, and desired to know more of what had happened to the man whom Venner had drugged. She did not dare venture as far as the little room, for fear that suspicious eyes should be watching her. It was just possible that Fenwick had given his satellites a hint to note her movements. Therefore, all she could do was to sit in the drawing-room with the door open. Some of the men began to pass presently, and after a little time, with a sigh of relief, Vera caught sight of the one upon whom the trick of the snuff was played. He seemed all right, as far as she could judge and the girl began to breathe a little more freely. As she sat there in the silence, watching and waiting, she saw Fenwick and his companion emerge from the dining-room and cross the hall in the direction of the billiard-room. Blossett was still talking lightly and incoherently. He leant on the arm of his host, and obviously the support was necessary. Vera had never before seen a drunken man under the same roof as herself, and her soul revolted at the sight. How much longer was this going on, she wondered. How much more could she be called upon to endure? For the present she had only to possess herself in patience and hope for the best. She was longing now for something like action. The silence and stillness of the house oppressed her. She would have liked to be up and doing something, anything better than sitting there. The silence was broken presently by the sound of angry voices proceeding from the billiard-room. Half a dozen men seemed to be talking at the same time. Words floated to Vera's ears. Then suddenly the noise ceased, as if somebody had clapped down a lid upon the meeting. Vera guessed exactly what had happened. The billiard-room door had been closed for fear of the servants hearing what was going on. It was just possible that behind those closed doors the mystery that had so puzzled Vera was being unfolded. She recollected now that between the dining-room and the billiard-room was a fairly large conservatory, opening on either side into the apartments in question. It was just possible that Fenwick and his companions might have overlooked the conservatory. At any rate, Vera determined to take advantage of the chance. The conservatory was full of palms and plants and flowers, behind which it was possible for the girl to hide and listen to all that was going on. Vera fully understood the danger she was running. She quite appreciated the fact that discovery might be visited with unpleasant consequences. But this did not deter her for a moment. She was in the conservatory a little later, and was not displeased to find that the door leading to the billiard-room was open. Behind a thick mask of ferns she took her stand. Between the feathery fronds she could see into the billiard-room without being seen. Fenwick was standing by the side of the table, laying down the law about something, while the rest of his men were scattered about the room. "'Why should I do it?' Fenwick was saying. "'Why should I trust a man like you?' You'll come down to-night on the most important errand, well knowing the risk you are running, and you start by getting drunk at the dinner-table. I wasn't drunk, Blossett said sullenly. As to the girl, why, I naturally expected. Who gave you the right to expect? Fenwick demanded. Couldn't you see at a glance that she knew nothing about it? Another word and you would have betrayed the whole thing. You can stay here all night and talk if you like, but you are not going to have that parcel to take away to London with you. In your present condition— you would be in the hands of the police before morning. But I haven't got a cent, Blossett said. I hadn't enough money in my pocket to pay my cab fare from Canterbury. And don't you try on any of your games with me. 
because I am not the sort of man to stand them. You are a fine lot of workmen, I know, but there isn't one of you who has the pluck and ability to take two thousand pounds worth of that stuff and turn it into cash in a week. Now look at the last parcel I had. I got rid of it in such a manner that no one could possibly discover that I ever handled the metal at all. Who among you could say the same thing? Oh, you are right enough, as long as you are sober, Fenwick said. But, all the same— I shall not trust you with the parcel that is waiting upstairs. Vera listened, comprehending but little of what was going on. After all, she seemed to be having only her trouble for her pains. Beyond doubt, these men were doing something illicit with the coinage of the country, though Vera could not bring herself to believe that they were passing off counterfeit money, seeing that the sovereigns were absolutely genuine. "'Well, something has to be done,' another of the gang remarked. "'We are bound to have a few thousand during the next few days.' and as Blossett says, there is nobody that can work the oracle as well as he can. The best thing I can do is to go to town with him and keep a close eye on him till he has pulled round once more. He can keep sober enough on occasions, if he likes, and once the drinking fit has passed, he may be right for weeks. "'I'm going to have no one with me,' Blossett roared. "'Do you think I'm going to be treated like a blooming kid? I tell you, I'm the best man of the lot of you. There isn't one of you can hold a candle to me. Fenwick, with all his cunning, is a child compared with Ned Blossett. Ask any of the old gang in New York. Ask the blistering police, if you like. And as to the rest of you, who are you? A set of white-faced mechanics, without pluck enough to rob a hen-roost. Take that, you cur! The speaker rose suddenly to his feet, and lurched across the room in Fenwick's direction. He aimed an unexpected blow at the ladder, which sent him headlong to the floor, and immediately the whole room was a scene of angry violence. Vera shrank back in her shelter hardly knowing what to do next. She saw that Blossett had disentangled himself from the mob about him, and was making his way headlong into the conservatory. There was nothing for it but instant retreat. On the opposite side was a doorway leading to the garden, and through this Vera hastily slipped, and darted across the grass, conscious of the noise and struggle going on behind. She paused with a little cry of vexation, as she came close to a man who was standing on the edge of the lawn, looking at the house. It was only for a moment that she stood there in doubt. Then a glad little cry broke from her lips. "'Charles,' she said, "'Mr. Evors, what are you doing here?' "'We will come to that presently,' Evors replied. "'Meanwhile, you can be observed from where you are, and those rioters yonder may make it awkward for you. When they have patched up their quarrel, I will return to the house with you and explain. We can get in by the little green door behind the gun-room.' Vera suffered herself to be led away feeling now utterly unable to be astonished at anything. They came at length to the secluded side of the house, where the girl paused and looked at her companion for an explanation. "'You seem to be strangely familiar with this place,' she said. "'You walk around here in the dark as if you had known this house all your lifetime. Have you been here before?' "'Many a time,' Evors replied sadly. "'Up to the time I was twenty my happiest years were spent here. But I see you are still in the dark.' Can you not guess who I really am, Vera? No? Then I will enlighten you. My name is Charles Evors, and I am the only son of Lord Merton. I was born here, and if the fates are good to me, some day I hope to die here. End of chapter 20